once you have clarified it in your own consciousness you can then use it for practical work in healing or consciousness development or whatever it is that you're focusing on doing so when I began to work with vibrational teachings and methods of different traditions all over the world which I was able to focus on during the 12 years that I spent at the university getting my doctorate in international studies there's always a challenge because different traditions will look at the vibrational realities around us the vibrations that affect human consciousness that affect our thoughts our feelings as well as our energy system every moment of every day they'll analyze these through different methods there's a concept that I refer to as the number prism that to understand any phenomena what we do in a modern scientific approach is we divide it into its component parts and so what you'll find in India for example to understand healing vibrations they tend to divide them into three different parts and they'll talk about the three gunas they'll talk about vata and pitta and kapha these are threefold division in the West, there'd often be a fourfold division of the four elements. In China, a fivefold division of the five elements. Well, there was an interesting statement by the great Rosicrucian teacher, Rudolf Steiner, where he said to fully understand any system in the world and to be able to differentiate out every one of its core aspects requires, at minimum, a twelve-fold division. This is a classical teaching from great spiritual and healing traditions in the world. That's why there are 12 disciples around the Christ, why there are 12 Imams in Shia Islam, why there are a division of the stars into 12 signs of the zodiac around the sun. It's 12 around the one. For those of you that know sacred geometry, and you look at how a cube is structured, a cube is the form that gives rise to matter. The cube has 12 lines that define the cube. If you look at a sphere, you can fit exactly 12 spheres around a central sphere. Again, 12 around the one. And so when I was doing this work to be able to understand all these different world systems and put them into a common unified system, I was looking for a method to be able to differentiate out the 12 core aspects within vital energy. So to lead to the discussion directly of this, I want to give a frame of reference of what we have done to create modern technology because sometimes we take for granted that we live in an age of technological miracles we just are so exposed to it every day we don't think about it anymore but the world has been completely transformed in the last 100 years through discoveries that have taken place over the last 150 years now what I'm referring to here is that to have a science you need to be able to differentiate any aspect of things into its component parts. You need to have a spectrum, what we would call spectrum analysis. So one of the first breakthroughs that we had was the identification of every type of matter that exists in the physical world. In the ancient world, you never had that. So we live in a material world, but we didn't know what all the different pieces of matter were until the latter part of the 1800s with the identification of the periodic table of elements. What is the, we call the periodic table of elements is really the identification of the complete spectrum of matter itself. Now we can be fully conscious of everything that makes up the physical world. That opened up everything in material science for all of our modern technology. But then there was another breakthrough that took place in the late 1800s and then was finalized in the year 1932. And that was identifying the complete spectrum of electromagnetic energy because until 1932, with the identification of microwaves, we didn't have an understanding of the complete spectrum of electromagnetic energies. So what you find in many classical traditions is that they will talk about different levels of creation. So there's the physical level. There is the etheric life energy level. That in China would be called qi, or in Japan would be called ki, or in India would be called prana. Greeks would call it the ether. So this etheric vital force energy is above that of the physical. Then there are consciousness levels, beginning with what we call in the West the astral level. Well, with all these different levels, we have to understand a progression that is taking place in modern science. And to do that, I think it's very helpful to review a particular concept coming from Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner mentioned at one time that people don't properly understand what electromagnetic energy is. Because time and time again, in subtle energy research in modern times, things dealing with etheric life force, 
with qi. We try to get validity from modern science by saying the li vital life force is electromagnetic. But in fact, according to Steiner, electromagnetic energy is not the vital life force. If it was, you could plug the base of your spine into an electrical outlet and get charged up. But it doesn't work that way. In fact, as we'll describe later tonight, there's a vibrational component in electromagnetic energy that is extremely toxic. And that's why people get electrosensitivity and have detrimental effects from electrical fields. So what he mentions is that what the vital life force is that's above the level of the physical, in every classical tradition, they understood that this vital life force is what went into the physical and animated it. It's the animating power. So when we understand that, we'll understand that when that power has animated the physical body through what the Chinese call the universal qi field or what the Greeks would call the ether, that animation process creates resistance passing through the conductor of the human body, passing through the conductor of physical materials, and that means that this faster-than-light energy slows way down. And this particular energy from the ether begins to decay. The decay of the etheric energy, of the vital force energy, is what we call electromagnetic energy. Doing any type of spiritual development, meditative training, that there's a balance between receptive meditation and active meditation. The problem being that in the modern world, most types of meditation taught by different teachers or schools are only one or the other. Meaning that either you're taught a type of emptiness meditation like Zen or Vipassana or Transcendental Meditation, like some Eastern schools, or on the other hand, you're taught a type of active meditation like creative visualization. Well, these are two opposite mind powers and they're both absolutely essential. But the problem is people are being taught today just to develop one side of it. Developing the receptive meditation where you can clear the mind and perceive what's actually empirically in front of you instead of constantly projecting stuff out allows you to perceive spiritual realities as they actually are without contaminating them with our own projections. So that's essential. However, the other side is also essential because what the creative visualization does is allows us to take action with the mind power. It allows us to craft or create things with the mind power. But if you developed only that side, you would not know if what you're perceiving spiritually is actually present or your own projection. And so for the receptive schools, they develop the capacity to clear the mind and see what's actually present, but they may not develop the capacity to actually take action. The other school develops the capacity to take action, but may not be able to see what's actually empirically present. So these two things have to go together. So for us being able to perceive higher spiritual beings, what I'm about to tell you now is a great simplification, but nonetheless I think helpful. To be able to perceive higher spiritual beings and not contaminate that with our own projections about them or our own emotional reactions to them requires doing regular receptive meditation to clear the mind, to see what's actually there. So we're not just constantly picking up our own projections. Whereas to develop a beneficial elemental being that we craft, that for example can be a healing elemental, as is used in the school of Daskalos, that requires the active meditation. So both these things are essential. And so people that just developed the capacity to develop their own elementals and understood that active side of it, sometimes the school will say, we don't have to worry about the actual angelic beings so they don't even exist. They're just all projections of your own mind because that's all they know. So we need to be aware that there's a lot of fragmentary teachings today. And what we're trying to do is trying to bring those pieces back together. So it is entirely possible for us to create our own projected elemental of an angelic being. And again, the school of Daskalos to go into great detail about how you do it and what those different beings may be. Now you'll see illustrations of this in classical medieval work where you do a meditation, for example, where you would create uh, the four archangels in four directions around you to seal the four directions. And now when you do that, you need to be very aware that what you're doing is you're creating elementals of the archangels. They're not the actual archangels. Archangels are way beyond us. Archangel Mikael, you cannot make him do anything. You can ask him for help. And if he likes you, he may come around to help you. But you can't make him do it. And so you can't just say, okay, I'm projecting Archangel Michael right there, and there's Archangel Michael and all of his power. You can project an elemental, 
and it is possible for Archangel Michael to connect his power to that elemental. But that's up to what your own quality is. If you're a black magician, if you've got all kind of weird stuff going on, you're probably not going to want to link to that energy. So the four archangels are extremely powerful objective forces that are different from our creation of the elemental of the angelic beings. So we want to make sure we don't confuse these two things. So this activity of creating the elementals is something that's been known for a long time. One way that we sometimes generate particularly mind form elementals is through the third eye center. And you will see this illustrated in classical mythology with things like spiritual beings that are being born full blown from the brow of Zeus, for example. That's actually a initiate consciousness illustration of the creation of an elemental being. Every human being is doing it. Just the difference is, do you know you're doing it or not? And what's the quality of that being? So what's often referred to amorphously as thought forms are actually at a deeper level connected to this beingness aspect of the elemental beings. But again, they don't have the whole power of those from the higher hierarchies or the Godhead. Because in a sense, we are the elementals from the Godhead, as are the higher angelic beings. 